you can ask a question via the ask a question box to the right of your screen. You can send questions at any time, no need to wait until the end. Um, I'll relay your questions to the speakers following the panel discussion. You can see speaker profiles and an overview of the presentation to your right. If you have any technical issues with the audio during the presentation, please check your connection. There is a link directly underneath the slides. You can also chat live with the technical support via that link if needs be. However, we have found that the most effective solution is to refresh your browser or log out and log back in again. And the, please note that to the best of the institution's knowledge, all permissions have been sought and given for this presentation. So our materials economy is linear. We take materials out of the ground, we make things, we use them, and then we dispose of them. But we live on a finite planet. The resources we have are all the resources that we will ever have. And when you throw something away, there is no away. Running in an infinite linear economy in a finite system is fundamentally impossible. The linear economy has also led to negative consequences such as man-made climate change, resource depletion, deforestation, loss of biodiversity, and pollution of land, air, and water. We need to start consuming resources to reflect the finite planet that we live on. We need to transition to a circular model where the concept of waste is eliminated, that is regenerative by design, and where everything becomes a resource for something else. We need a circular economy. As one of the largest users of materials, the construction industry must play a role in transitioning to a circular economy. So what does that look like? It means designing for maximum longevity, buildings that adapt to changing circumstances, retaining and reusing becoming the norm, demolishing far less than we do now, and carefully dismantling when we do. It means keeping materials and components at their highest value for as long as possible, and in all cases, designing the possibility of disassembly for future reuse. How can the industry facilitate this? And will this happen in response to governmental policies or will it be driven by the private sector? This technical discussion will look at the ways in which circular economy thinking is being implemented within construction already from both a technical and logistical perspective and what the future of circular economy and construction might look like. Our panel for the evening includes experts representing both design and construction. Each will bring their unique views about how we can make the most of this new approach to construction. Penny Gowler is Associate Director at Elliott Wood, a structural and civil engineering practice. She has over 15 years structural engineering experience and is the practice's sustainability lead. She is instrumental in embedding embodied carbon analysis across Elliott Wood projects and she's passionate about low carbon design and aims to drive structural engineering projects towards a lower carbon circular economy approach. Andrea Charlson is senior advisor at ReLondon. ReLondon is a partnership of the mayor of London and the London boroughs to improve waste and resource management and transform the city into a leading low carbon circular economy. Andrea is a chartered engineer and chartered environmentalist. She works with private and public sector partners to increase the reuse and recycling of construction waste and to embed design for adaptability, flexibility and deconstruction into developments across London. She is coordinating the London cluster of the EU Horizon 2020 funded project Circular Construction in Regenerative Cities circuit. Charlie Wedgwood is executive assistant at McGee, a London based specialist engineering contractor. Charlie has a passion for sustainable and practical designs that drive better performing processes within construction. Since joining McGee, he has been helping drive the company's sustainability strategy and engaging in industry working groups to help bridge the gap between the consultant and the contractor. Having spent seven years as a consultant structural engineer, Charlie believes early involvement of the specialist engineering contractor in the design process can produce, can produce unrivaled results. So welcome everyone. And uh, let's get started with you each giving us a short introduction to what the circular economy means to you. Penny. Thank you, Laura. Um, so from the point of view of a structural engineer working on a construction project, I like to think about the circular economy in two ways, really. Number one, 
If you have an existing building on your site, then it's about understanding what's in that building and trying to reuse as much as possible, either in situ or in a new building, either your project or someone else's project. If you don't have an existing building on your site, then it's designing your new building for deconstruction in future, trying to source secondhand materials for the building and thinking about adaptability for the future. I generally don't think we have a choice but to find ways to repurpose and reuse our existing materials and buildings. There are many challenges to making this happen, but there are also many opportunities for new industries and an enhanced role for structural engineers in particular. Thank you. Thanks. Shall we go to Andrea? Sure, thank you. I think I just wanted to start with um, a bit of a don't panic moment. <laughs> So um, the circuit project that Laura mentioned in my intro, um, the whole premise of that project is looking to scale up the adoption of circular construction techniques from individual niche projects to things that are adopted citywide. And I think for me, that's what's really important and exciting about this moment in time. Um, I realized today, it was 15 years ago, that I um, actually received funding from the I2T through what was then called the Rowan Travel Award to um, travel to Berlin um, and watch people um, take down these precast concrete tower blocks, repurpose the structural concrete to new structural walls in smaller individual family homes. That was 15 years ago. So what we're doing now, it's, it's not brand new. We're not uh, we're not taking the first steps into this journey. Lots of people have taken steps before us. We can now join them and really accelerate the transition, which I think is what's important. Yeah, I think that's a really important uh, point. Thank you. And uh, Charlie. Thank you. Good evening. Um, so to start with, um, I think we have um, a responsibility as, as structural engineers. I think when I first um, decided to do structural engineering at university, I, I coined the phrase that structural engineers were the unsung heroes of society. And I feel that we still uh, are sort of seen that way. And so I think um, we as, as, as designers and, and contractors have a responsibility to, to, to enable uh, low carbon solutions. So I think, you know, there's, there's various streams that that can be done. And this is clearly um, a very important one. And I think I want to make the point that it's really important to to make this a collaborative process. It's not there's not a one solution fits all, um, and I think construction, which inherently and possibly um, as a legacy issue, has been slow to react. But I feel that the way that um, technology is going and the way that we use BIM, we have a greater opportunity than most industries to to create a circular economy um, in in, our, in the way that that we construct and design and use and deconstruct buildings. Um, and finally, I think um, this is all a bit of a call to arms into understanding and being able to communicate through contracts and through um, metrics that tenders should not just be about the commercial reasons. It should not just be about cost and program, but it should also include carbon. And I think the, the sooner that we start measuring um, tenders um, on their carbon value, the the, um, the the greater significance and the greater um, potential we have to creating more circular buildings. Great, thanks everyone. So let's dive in. So I think we'll start by uh, talking about setting ourselves up for success. So can uh, can you tell us what a good circular economy brief and program might look like and how it might differ from the more traditional route? Um, Penny, should we start with you? And if you have examples, that would be great as well. Um, yep, yeah, sure. So I would say the main difference with getting circular economy principles uh, built into a programme for a new project is to talk about it. The sooner, the better. So I think ideally you would be able to talk to the client before any a development was even on the cards. Uh, perhaps looking at their portfolio of buildings and identifying opportunities for how you might be able to um, maybe deconstruct one building to help construct another building or repurpose existing buildings. So I really think it's about talking to the client as soon as possible, influencing the brief rather than just being handed a brief on a plate. Um, and if you are in a position where you are given a brief and maybe you're working on an existing building, we know that the 
a client or developer has a series of other buildings, then it's questioning that brief. Uh, it's it's question, making loads of questions, being difficult, saying, why aren't we reusing these elements? Why can't you look at doing this? Why can't we look at doing that? Um, and then I think it's about getting the right people on board. So I think Charlie's already touched on the importance of engaging with uh, deconstruction specialists. So I won't call them demo contractors. I think there's a, a much stronger role for uh, demolition engineers or deconstruction engineers to play. And I think they should sit alongside the design team as a sort of part-time member of the design team alongside the architect, structure engineering, et cetera. Um, and then it's getting it's basically setting the rules for the project at the beginning, setting your aspirations and making sure that everything you do through that design process reflects those rules and aspirations that you've set yourself right down to what goes into specifications, how you're tendering uh, different packages. Like Charlie says, building in different metrics. I know we'll come on to that later. Um, I would say it could be a much more complicated and non-linear program than a traditional knockdown and rebuild. But I think the benefits and the, the gains for everyone involved are, are significant. And I think we really need to be doing that as soon as possible. Do you think that the engineer should be involved earlier? Than traditionally yeah, definitely <laughs> definitely i think most people working in the industry would would argue for that i think it's so frustrating when you get involved at say stage two stage three even later and the architect's been involved since maybe stage zero stage one they've already sort of set the brief and someone's already predetermined whether that existing building is going to be knocked down um perhaps for reasons completely unrelated to structure. And it's very hard at that point to go in. And despite asking all the awkward questions, it, it can be very hard to go in at that point and, and convince the client to, to take, you know, take a completely different approach and do a U-turn and, and on what they've already decided. So yeah, the sooner we get involved, the better. And I would argue that structural engineers in particular have a huge amount to offer by sitting alongside clients before they're even thinking about developing buildings to actually go in and say, right, let's look at your portfolio of buildings. Let's look at the ones that you're starting to think about developing in the next five to 10 years. And we can go in and we can understand what's in those existing buildings, create um, inventories of what's in those existing buildings, do some limited investigations, can tell you a lot about those buildings. And with knowledge comes power, really. And once you know what's in those buildings, you can start to think about repurposing them or repurposing the materials. Mm -hmm. Um, Charlie, would you like to talk about the brief and the program from your perspective? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. And um, yeah, to start start from the beginning, I think we, we've touched on how important it is to, for proper planning and the importance of bringing in someone who understands how to deconstruct buildings is imperative. And I think if you look at the traditional model, the the designer is 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 very much focused on how to construct the building. And they don't necessarily have the experience, or certainly some of my experiences, they didn't necessarily have the experience to know how to deconstruct certain types of structures. You know, we have various different forms of structure, various different composite structures and sequences of how things were built. So it's such that you, you start to build a picture of how difficult it might be to deconstruct a building. So if you're able to, to bring in the right people at the, right, at the start of the process to help plan and to be able to understand and start to dissect a structure, this will, this will help the process. So on that start, starting point, if, if you are able to, to understand a bit more about your material asset, and that's what we're trying to establish here, we're trying to realize the material asset value, we need to do various surveys. And these surveys will take longer. They probably will be more invasive than um, your traditional uh, opening up works and they, they might take longer. We want to build models which you wouldn't inherit. You wouldn't normally build an existing uh, BIM model, which is probably where we should be going as an industry. I think, and then if you if you were to move through that process in a traditional sense, I don't think there's much discrepancy. But the, diff the, the key difference for me is, is designing with a more flexible uh, specification, which is slightly revolutionary. Because what we're talking about is designing with existing materials, which we don't have all the information about. So if you if you ask me what the perfect um, reuse uh, program would look like, it would be longer at the start to do the reconnaissance. Then I would speed up the stage two, stage three process to, to define the parameters, but in a broad sense. 
and then I would elongate stage stage four. Now that is um, slightly difficult because I would then say we should start deconstructing the building. We should be looking to to, to get a vacant site to then be able to understand the materials we've got in the building a bit more, so we can do the testing. We can do we can build the the um, the material inventory, and we can understand how we might be able to reuse those materials on our site because that's where there is real opportunity. So there needs to be incentive obviously to that happen because you know a longer construction process or a vacant site means um, you know a possibly a more um, expensive scheme. So there needs to be creative thinking around what can be done with those those vacant sites. So to answer your question, it's, just, it's longer at the start, shorter in the middle, and then a longer program towards just, just before you start re reconstruct or reconstructing the building. Yeah, so um, I'm glad you brought up the um, the sort of increased need for assessments and surveys. Um, how how do you sell that? Uh, how do you sell the upfront investment um, to a client who possibly isn't uh, interested or who might not understand the benefits? Um, Charlie, let's go back to you. I think um, in terms of in terms of selling it to to the clients, it's it's very difficult in some senses because there isn't a tangible metric to say this is going to be your carbon reuse value. Um, I think what we could, what can be pitched to the client and how we have pitched it before is that there is opportunity to, to reduce the cost of the final solution if you are able to reuse materials. And we are able to reduce the final um, carbon impact of the building because we can, we, we can start to look at a, a baseline uh, amount of carbon that we would um, that we would ordinarily be using for a new steel beam versus a, a, a reused steel beam, we can look at the comparison. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of that upfront cost, you know, I think there's there's two there's two sort of slight models. You know, the traditional contractor model where you're you know you're profit focused, you're looking at turnover. Um, but then secondly, you've got the other model, which is a design service. I would say that in that first instance, we it has to be procured as a design service and that's where the shift in mentality from having a contractor is involved early who is maybe on um you, you know doing it pro rata or uh, sorry pro bono or whether they are are doing it and and and, and writing off the cost i think it has to be procured in a sufficient way um okay let's um let's think about uh zooming out from kind of individual projects um and look on a more kind of citywide level. Um, what are the main considerations that are needed in order to make the sharing and reusing of materials possible? So Andrea, this one's for you. Um, what is London currently working on? And are there any good examples from other cities that you might want to tell us about? Sure, I think, you know, there's quite a few um, reasons why it's not as easy uh, to use reclaimed materials as it is to use uh, new materials. Um, and some of them are information based. I think Charlie already mentioned you might not be able to know as much about the material in advance if it's uh, coming from a secondary source than um, if it's uh, brand new. Um, and then the other kind of big chunk of issues is around just logistics. I've actually finding the material and or getting it to the site that it's needed from the site where it's being produced. Um, and so I think those are challenges that could can be tackled um, or are probably better tackled, not at an individual project level. Um, in circuit, we're looking at um, trying to address some of those from the perspective of um, standardizing a pre-demolition audit process or a pre-redevelopment audit process to kind of be more circular and align with um, what, Pop, what Penny's been saying. Um, and so really trying to capture information um, about what the materials are and how they could be reused um, in a standardized and efficient way. And then also from a London perspective, um, again, seeing what um, Charlie's been saying, a much earlier Point in the process. So with the new London plan policy that um, uh, came into force in March, um, there's a requirement for referable schemes to produce a circular economy statement. And one of the elements of that, it says it should include a pre-demolition audit if there's an existing building on the site. 
and all of that has to happen pre-planning application. So it really is pushing those um, decisions and explorations to the, the front end of the process, which I completely agree is really important. Um, and then the other aspect that we're exploring is around um, digital interfaces to help raise the availability of materials and make those connections between um, donor sites and receiver sites. There's quite a lot of um, uh, platforms that exist at different scales. Um, most of them are not really um, suitable for mass commercial construction and structural materials at this point in time. Um, so over the next 18 months, we're kind of seeing if we can give those existing platforms a, a leg up to help um, them scale up from maybe a more domestic market to a large commercial market. And um, do you see the um, the kind of the citywide uh, help being um, the driving force, or does it is it will is, is it going to come from kind of indi individuals asking for these markets? Um, I suppose the answer is uh, is both, but I was wondering maybe if um, Andrea, you could um, talk to us from a kind of city uh, citywide level, and then um, I think I'll go back to Penny to. Uh, talk on a more individual project level. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think the um, the city level leadership um, is is important for raising the bar. I think uh, there's always a bit of a a concern that when something gets adopted into policy and becomes a mandatory requirement, that it it almost gets diluted because it, there's such a risk of it becoming a tick box rather than it being fully embedded into the client brief and the design process and all that stuff. Um, but at the same time, it, hopefully it is a, a catch-all to, to move the wider industry on um, as if people maybe are less familiar with these ideas, kind of see this new requirement coming uh, into force and having to explore these ideas and what it actually means for their projects. Um, I think the ways it will be best achieved or you know more effectively achieved will be probably by uh you know at an individual project level we need to achieve it on a project level and it needs to be really really embedded it's not something that can be solved at, at a city level we can just provide the the city level can provide you know the platform and the encouragement and the the direction of travel I think I think from a project point of view and from a client point of view, the, the big shift we've been seeing in the last six to twelve months is all the big kind of landowners, developers, clients in London in particular are declaring net zero by 2030, and then in some cases wondering how they're going to achieve it. Um, and we've been having a lot of conversations with some of these big big developers about how they can look at reusing existing buildings rather than demo and new build um, and how they can potentially start to um, exchange materials between each other and setting up starting to set up their own material transfer networks so where for instance uh, one client has got a building that they know they're going to be deconstructing uh, they're deconstructing it to salvage a lot of the existing steelwork and then they're offering that up to other clients who have other developments where they might be able to use that steelwork. So these things are starting to happen. And I think um, these big declarations about carbon net zero by 2030 have been the catalyst for that in the last 12 months or so. And I think the other point to make is, it's not necessary that like everything has to be done now. I think it's more a case of if we're doing something and make, taking the steps to solving some of the, the barriers and the challenges to, um, to implementing material reuse on projects, then we're going in the right direction. If we just sit back and don't even ask the questions and don't even try, then I think we're failing in our responsibility as, as engineers because fundamentally, uh, so our responsibility is to conserve resources. Um, I think there are big challenges around costs, uh, which Charlie's already touched on, about how do you convince clients to do assessments and investigations early on. And I'll be honest with you, it's a challenge that I'm having on a daily basis. Um, but like I said, some of, I think the early adopters are going to be the big landowners and the big 
big clients in London in particular where they've made these big declarations and now they have to put their hands in their pockets as early adopters to make it happen on some of their projects. And I think once we are getting a, a decent number of projects where we are following these principles, then it will start to snowball. And as Andrea's already pointed out, policy will be put in place or is being put in place and it is starting to have an impact already. And no doubt that will become greater over time. I think just sorry to, to, to pick up on, on, on your piece there about um, about financing. I think um, there's, there's there's been quite a, a dis disparity between uh, the funders and, and through to the contractors. And I think there's um there's there's an importance to, to to kind of focus on this communication line um you know you 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 listen to um to podcasts and, and and read news articles on the importance of esg funds and green finance this is the opportunity to for those funders to demonstrate they are investing in sustainable and uh, truly uh, carbon efficient so solutions and and that, that sort of upfront investment is 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 um is a way to appeal to uh to to the funders. I think the other thing to also bear in mind is that um, quite a lot of our current challenges are around knowing, like Pally saying, doing assessments up front because we don't know what's there, we don't have enough information. Um, so we can also, um, as engineers and designers, be starting to solve that problem for the future as well um, by, uh, you know, with the ideas of uh, material passports, um, which is a, you know, a little bit of jargon word, but it's a, the, the essence of the material passport though, is knowing what materials you've got where, um, what they've been used for, and ideally what they could be used for uh, in a future life, you know, in, in a quite a, a simple form. And, you know, whether you've got, um, a current building or whether you're just starting new or if you're having to get rid of the current building and you're starting a new we can be thinking about documenting that building and we can also be thinking about the design decisions we're making for that building enabling that future reuse so i know that um a, a project that I, i'm aware of um they've got a relatively recent build um but the uh the owner doesn't have the drawings of it, um, even though it's fairly recent. So they're having to kind of do a lot of work. They had to do a lot of work to understand what was there. And then they found that what was there wasn't reusable, even though it's a steel frame being replaced by a steam steel frame. In this case, it was because it had all been designed a composite. Um, and so the client in that instance is now a bit like annoyed that they can't have a really good reuse story, but that's inspired them to include circular aspects in their brief for the new development in terms of enabling future reuse and thinking that kind of long term low carbon perspective as well, as well as just like low carbon now. So I think that's a really interesting angle to keep in mind. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree, Andrea. I think it's so, so important that even if you're not working on existing building or not able to reuse materials that you are recording what's in in those buildings that we are designing. I mean, I've been looking at some buildings this week that were built in the 1950s and 1960s, and there's just zero information about them whatsoever. And it's so frustrating because you know that even if you had a snippet of information, you know, you don't have to have full reinforcement drawings. But if you just knew how thick the slabs were, which way they were spanning, that would release you to be able to do a whole load of sort of feasibility work. Whereas at the moment, before we do any investigations, we're, we're kind of just guessing based on experience. So, yeah, I think it's hugely important. And I mean, it's probably a step too far at the moment, but it would be lovely if we could come up with some sort of central database of building information. I mean, that would be the ideal. Um, and personally, I'm still slightly unsure whether the BIM is the right format to be recording all that information for longevity. Um, but I think if there was a way that we could come up with a way of solving this issue and having a central database perhaps you know building control used to do it but we all know that building control records are you know they can be good occasionally but generally they're not very good um is there a place for the institutions to have a role in this to to keep some sort of database we will probably say no um is there a place for government i don't know but somewhere i think there needs to be some sort of central repository 
I think Andrea you said in in one of the Scandinavian countries they do record like for instance all the buildings that have been demolished and what materials were there so it is doable on a large scale. Yeah just to clarify they don't have full bill of quantities but they know a lot more about their existing built environment stock like how old they are and their key construction materials is is they know it it's amazing <laughs> whereas we just don't which is different. <laughs> I think going on to the last point about the deconstruction um, element is that designing a deconstruction uh, process is something which we don't do. And O&M manuals are inherently poor. And I think uh, if you look at the, the Reva stages, you know, there should be more of a, an onus on, on, the, um, on the contractor to, to have a narrative around how to deconstruct the building or at least how it was constructed. So therefore, you can you know how to take it apart. Um, and touching on your last point about um, date, databases, there's um, a Scandinavian company called Circularize. Um, actually, not Scandinavian, sorry. They're from the Netherlands called Circularize. Um, and they have um, sort of a, a blockchain, which essentially, um, if you uh, you create a material passport for different things like televisions, it's not necessarily applied to construction, but it's a, it's a transaction-based uh, approach. So you can find out what, um, what different component parts are of different, um, of, of different sort of pieces of equipment. So that could be sort of extended to, to, to buildings. Okay, thanks all. Um, we had our first con possibly contentious point uh, to give this, this debate its name about uh, BIM not being the tool. So I might come back to that if we have time at the end to hear your opinions. Uh, but let's move on to the topic of, of metrics. Um, so Andrea, could, could you tell us how you can measure the circularity of a particular project? Is, is there a value in measuring? Um, what are the metrics we can use now and how might they be improved or expanded in the future? Yeah, I think it's an interesting um, topic and one that lots of different people are grappling with, especially because circularity um, you know, has the, its different manifestations, like the, the reuse of material is completely different to designing a structure to be disassembled, but um, both equally <laughs> of importance in, in a fully circular economy. So I would say that um, metrics are still in development. There isn't like a, a circularity index or metric that is, is commonly, commonly used. Um, I would say um, people tend to use a range of metrics, um, including for, um, well, if there's an existing uh, structure, you could have the percentage of the structure that's retained, and um, that could be by area, it could be by mass of materials, depending on um, the different type of building. Um, for the new elements, you could kind of flip that on the head, so the percentage of the, of the new construction that is um, either of, of reclaimed source or recycled source. So those are the kind of like input metrics that are often quoted. Um, other metrics that are considered like that could be um, total mass of materials or more commonly like total mass of virgin materials with the idea of circularity uh, it, in its kind of absolute purest form being like no materials in and no materials out. So you could have metrics that looked at um, the amount of virgin materials used and the amount of waste and um, potential waste generated either at point of construction or uh, most circular at end of life. Um, and then there's the, as I was kind of alluding to, the more kind of uh, future looking metrics. So uh, what proportion of the structure is adaptable? It's quite, there's no real like defined de like definition for that, defined definition, that's a great phrase, um, and, and percentage of the structure that could be demountable um, or reusable. Um, so these are kind of all evolving, these kind of metrics. Um, people often fall back on uh, carbon as a normalizer because we are much more developed in the kind of carbon assessment world and the, the rules of the game kind of uh, spent a lot of years thrashing those out. Um, I think carbon is useful as a metric, but I would caution about it being the only metric that's being considered because it definitely doesn't capture like the full aspects of circularity. So if you are designing for deconstruction, um, that most in most uh, rules of the game would not be included in your whole life carbon footprint, the benefit of that. Um, so I would recommend that if you're using uh, carbon as a metric, it's a great metric and I think we should use it, but have a separate metric or a couple of metrics for your circularity ambitions, um, depending on the different context of your building. 
Um, Penny and Charlie, do you have any examples of when you've measured the circularity of a building or of a, of a project? So we've done um, quite a few reuse viability assessments. We've done uh, deconstruction appraisals, um, which um, the only way really to to give a tangible uh, benefit is, is is to run a sort of analysis. And, and the way that we've approached it um, is to create a baseline scenario. So um, you would sort of um, substitute. Uh, so you would you create your 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 new building asset. Um, using the sort of you know trad what would be more sort of more traditional route, so um, a, a two set a steel uh, sorry S two seven five steel, and then you would um, and then we've we've created the scenario where we would reuse the steel. So we have then calculated um, how much uh, carbon we would emit by going to and from um, a, a, a storage depot uh, via a, um, a refabrication yard, and try to um, to, to bring some numbers towards how much uh, carbon we would emit during that process and then bring it in, into situ. And so you, you can then create a, um, a, a scenario where you are able to track how much benefit there is. Now, I think the really interesting point about this is that you're then essentially creating what, what, what is sort of a, a scope for um, emission. And I think what's really um, interesting about that is that if we can create um, uh, a model where we we bring scope for um, uh, kind of carbon accounting to, uh, to, to 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 companies as opposed to thinking about buildings. We will start to make people accountable. So if we are able to say the the this company has enabled um, uh, this carbon reduction through the use of reuse, then they can use that as a com as as a benefit. And I think that's where we'll we will start to see real uh, movements in the industry because otherwise it will be people sort of slightly tipping their toes in, but the vast majority will, will, will sort of use the escape grid if it's too expensive. So if we are able to, to, to kind of create those two scenarios by the, by the baseline measurement and then by the reuse measurement and create that, this is the benefit, then I think that um, then there's, there's gonna be more scope for it to be used in, 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 in sort of other um, areas. I, I would just add, I mean, I would just say that generally we use a similar approach. Then we'll look at a sort of business as usual case and then compare what we're trying to do against that business as usual case, both in terms of carbon, but also in terms of waste. So looking at sort of per percentage of materials diverted from standard recycling rates. So I think um, percentage diversion from landfill is a, is a statistic used a lot in the industry and most sort of demolition contractors will quote 95 percent plus these days um, i suppose what we need to be looking at is looking at actual reuse so diverting away from those standard recycling routes um, which generally are downcycling or downcycling the value of those materials and um, they're, they're the main ones we've been focusing on um, but again similar to andrea just looking at ways how we can measure the flows the material flows really in and out of the circle and trying to minimize them as much as possible. But it's a work in progress, I would say. Uh, there's lots of different groups looking at it, including Letty, UKGBC, um, Re London. So yeah, lots, lots of work in that area. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually gonna bring in a question from uh, the audience because it fits quite well. Um, so Liz asks, is there a dominant preference uh, on how to measure circularity? Can there be one metric or should it be just acknowledged that different methods, reuse, disassemble, deconstruction, et cetera? Um, and would you prefer to use different metrics? So I think we'll start with Andrea and then go Charlie and Penny. Yeah, I think it's interesting Like different metrics have different values, um, both at different parts in the project process as, as well. Um, I don't I don't think there's a dominant preference. I have my dominant preference, but I wouldn't say it's an industry-wide dominant preference. It's a debate. You can <laughs> say incendiary things. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, I mean, I, I think the, you know, if we could get an agreed metric for the input indicator and agreed metric for the output indicator, add them together, and you're aiming for zero, like that, that's what we want. But I think actually those two halves are really, really complicated as the kind of question acknowledges. So um, I think especially as the first step, we should acknowledge that in and out are currently separate. 
and we should have at least one indicator that reflects at either side of that that process would be what I would suggest. Charlie, anything to add? I think what I the only thing I would would, would bring to this um, is that if there is one defined metric, if we're measuring and tracking that, we can establish trends, and therefore you could then start to look at um, what where where the the next gain might be. Um, I don't necessarily have a, an answer to, to to being one metric or not, unfortunately. I think the other thing to acknowledge as well is that as we are on on the process and on the journey, some of the um, the metrics are less engineering and less man managed measury in like have you done this like tip but have you done your your pre-redevelopment assessment it's only a yes no answer but actually looking at those trends over time and seeing that as a proportion like as a city can kind of come back to a city level or even if you're like a developer with a portfolio of projects you know what percentage of my projects am i asking for these early stage appraisals is a metric that can be used across a portfolio of projects or across a city um, much easier to implement than a as yet to be defined holistic circularity indicator but it's a real step on the journey yeah i think i just would would uh, basically reflect what andrea and charlie have both said um i think carbon is a useful metric and it obviously doesn't deal with all aspects of circular economy and it is a separate metric in many ways but I do think it's useful. I do think it's the, the the metric that we are going to be closest to incorporating alongside pounds value to help us to revalue buildings. Because at the moment we don't value secondhand materials um, and we can't really use pounds to value those secondhand materials necessarily because quite often they are genuinely more expensive. You know, a, a contractor I spoke to said, it costs a lot more money and labour to take a timber joist out of a building as a whole timber joist than it does to just and sorry and then move that timber joist to storage and then move it somewhere else than it does to just go down to Travis Perkins or any other timber merchant and buy a new piece of timber. Um, that's the kind of global market that we're in. Maybe it's the difference isn't quite so great at the moment given the material shortage. Um, but so I think quantifying carbon is helpful to start having that value discussion if we can put that alongside pounds and in terms of circularity metrics i don't have a strong opinion at the moment i think we're quite early on the road um, and i think we need to record what information we can and it's taken a long time with carbon to get embodied carbon to get any sort of agreed methodology and we're only just getting to the point where there is that agreed methodology so i, I do think that circular economy it's going to take a few years to, to get there so that's leading on to uh, the next topic quite nicely. So um, moving towards a circular economy will require changes at all levels. Um, so we've touched on this briefly earlier, but who is best placed to drive that change? Is it the policymakers, the developers, the financial institutions? Um, Charlie, maybe you'd like to start with this one and then I'll come to uh, the others. Yes, I think, um... I think this this is this is sort of coming back to do you need a flexible model or is there a, is there a, is there a one size fits all? This is very much a, a kind of collaboration. I think there needs to be um, a target set by the by the by the client. They you know they need to take responsibility for their for their buildings and be held accountable for them, which you've touched on with this, this potentially uh, the, the scope one and two emissions, and then maybe having a scope four emission. And then I think there needs to be an onus on the on, on the the um, principal designer to be able to coordinate the process because obviously they have a, a very much a close relationship with the uh, the clients at that first stage. And then moving through into um, using the uh, the contractor. And I must I must sort of stress that I'm not talking about a main contractor here who um, it sort of manages supply chains. I, I'm I'm more talking about the the contractor who knows how to uh, deconstruct and construct the building. So and not necessarily just a a sort of frame contractor or not necessarily just a, a facade contractor it needs to be someone who, who delivers those those solutions um so the responsibility shifts and it's a true collaboration so what i would say is that there's not necessarily one person who needs to lead it it will it will change throughout the process but what 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 does need to happen is people need to be accountable for 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 what for what they're they're they're, they're, they're um they're pledging 
Um, I think probably it will start with those big developers and big clients that I've already already mentioned, um, but that's just a small subset of the industry. Um, ultimately, I don't think whole scale change within the construction industry will happen until there is some sort of carrot or stick to make it happen, or pe perhaps a mixture of both. Uh, so I do think in the long run, policy will be required. Um, and I think, you know, the landfill tax that was introduced a good few years ago now is, is a good case in point about reducing waste to landfill. So we need something similar for circular economy. Um, I also think that everyone in the industry probably needs to reappraise their attitude towards risk generally. Um, you know, is it really that risky to reuse a steel beam that's been taken out of a building and tested so we actually know its, know its properties? You know, arguably, if it's a grade one listed building, then we're reusing steelwork that's 100 years old. And whilst we might test a proportion of that steelwork during investigations, we're certainly not testing every single beam in, or column in that building. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a whole piece of work to be done around funders, the financial side of of the industry, um, warranties, and just reappraising that attitude towards risk and education as well, I think. Yeah, and I, th I think I'd agree. I think I, I think we should not. There's always a risk when we're talk, having these kind of discussions about it's always everyone else's problem, and everyone else always has to take the lead. So I think we should definitely accept that there's definitely a role for everyone to play. There's 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 changes, small for some people and bigger for other roles that need to be accommodated. Um, um, I think. It, it always helps a whole design team and the whole process when it's embedded into the brief from the bar at the beginning. So it's kind of, it does often come back to the developer and the client as being the people to take the lead. I do agree, I think policy has a role. I don't necessarily think policy will solve the problem, but I think at the moment, I don't think we've got a level playing field either. And it's maybe distorting it even more than it should be. There's more tax on labor than materials it takes more labor to refurbish a boom than it does to get a new beam there's more tax on refurbishment than new build like all of these things are policy decisions not within the built environment that are distorting uh even the the economic uh field as it is now never mind the fact that we need to yeah reevaluate what we value and, and take into account the future value of buildings and you know demountability and carbon and all those things even on a normal balance spreadsheet, policy isn't helping at the moment. So I think there is a role for policy, but I don't think policy is the answer um, because it's too late by the time policy asks for it. We might be getting maybe embodied carbon in building regs at some point now. We've been asking for that for 10 years, like literally actively asking straight to DCLG. So let's not, let's not wait for policy. <laughs> We won't hold our breath. <laughs> um, OK, so just before we move on to uh, a couple of audience questions, um, I wanted to ask all three of you if there are any misconceptions about circular economy that you'd like to address. So, Andrea, you, you already touched on some in your intro. Um, so I think we'll just go right back to you uh, in case you'd like to mention anything. Um, the biggest misconception, and hopefully by this point in the conversation, uh, we've got rid of this, is that recycling is the circular economy. It's not in a circular economy. Recycling is the worst option. Like if you see the layers of circling, we've got to keep the assets in use, repurpose the assets, you know, reuse the materials within them, and if you have to, like recycle. It's not. It's not circular economy. So let's stop thinking about that all right that's a good one thank you uh penny um i think andrea has got the best one um i would suppose my misconception which i probably don't have enough proof for but i just feel that there's a big misconception that reusing materials will always cost more and i just i can't i just don't think that that can always be the case and i think that's something that as engineers we have a big role to play uh, to break down that that misconception. Um, you know, there are ways to design buildings uh, reusing what we've already got that can't cost significantly more. 
and we should just be chipping away and and you know getting those low hanging fruit as as quickly and as best we can. I, I would also um, to add to that in, in the sense that if you are able to um, get get a, a, a contractor in early who's able to 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 advise on how to deconstruct a building and how to maybe phase the works in such a way that you are you are enabling. Uh, reuse of, of a certain part of, of, of the building which which is more readily re reusable than say the in situ concrete frame unless unless of course you're retaining it um, there might be areas of the site which could be opened up first and therefore there is potential gains to be had by sequencing works very carefully um, and so there, there is there is opportunity that that isn't necessarily realized um, without with, without kind of proper due consideration for for the methodology. So what I would say is that, um, that the, the misconception that it is more costly, it's going to be more, um, it's going to take longer, whilst it might might be right in the short term, but in the long term, I think that there's efficiencies to be had because the, the, as soon as the, 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 the reuse market starts to gain a bit more momentum, uh, we'll, we'll start to see that the, the, the really sort of expensive part of it, i.e. the storage of the material and the remanufacture or refabrication of the material or, however you want to to kind of to, to phrase it, um, will 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 create its own efficiency. So um, if we at the front end can 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 streamline the deconstruction process and the methodology and the sequence, we can create that opportunity to try and offset what the the, the difficulties that we're having with with the market at the moment. Great. Thank you uh, all of you for your um very interesting points. Uh, so I think I'm just going to start um, reading out some questions from our audience. So um, the first one is from Jonathan. Do you envisage significantly changing current construction methods, i.e. composite design, to enable easier deconstruction? Or is there a precedent that structures can already be dismantled efficiently? Let's start with Penny. Um, with respect to composite construction, I think it's, I think from a pure circular economy point of view, then minimising the use of composites is is the best thing to do in in designs of of new buildings now. Um, I think there is increasing guidance um, around designing those elements, like a composite metal deck, reinforced concrete slab, for instance. There there is a design guide out there which allows you to design it so it can be deconstructed without having the welded um, shear studs. So you have bolted studs instead. Um, so I think it is it is starting to change, but I suppose my mantra internally at Elliot Wood is, is to try and avoid composite construction as far as possible at the moment. In, in any uh, project or ones with well, cir circular aspects? Do you well, find that the, the advice is coming to, is you're applying it on all buildings now? We're, we're trying to. Um, I, I get a little bit kind of anxious if we if we start specifying metal uh, metal deck composite slabs, for instance. Um, and I will always try and, and come up with an alternative, uh, usually CLT if if possible. Um, so yeah, we are trying to. I wouldn't say that we're achieving that yet because obviously there's a huge number of external factors that we're not in control of and can't always make decisions. But yeah, it's, it is something that we're trying to do. I think we've hit on a, on a really interesting topic here because what we've essentially just said is that we're going to start designing new structures um, with, with, with new materials in mind. What we really should be doing is designing the structure with what we already have. So the, the question really is, 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 are we going to be able to uh, take structures that we've got at the moment, dismantle them and then re-erect them in, 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 the, in the right um, way to be able to deconstruct them now? The honest answer is that you have to work with what we have with, with with the material that you have at the moment. Now, obviously, the use of resins, adhesives, and mastics is is really is, is really detrimental to to the the reuse potential. Um, so you, you you kind of you obviously want to steer away with that. Certainly, certainly with the finishes and and, and the fit out and uh, in um, that kind of avenue. But I realise this is probably not the forum for that. Um, but in terms of um, going back to the question, so I'll have to complete mind blank. I'll have to move on to, to Laura. <laughs> Would you like me to repeat it? <laughs> um, 
it uh, it was do you envisage significantly changing current construction methods i.e composite design to enable easier deconstruction or is there a precedent that structures can already be dismantled there are there are there are very steep various good examples of of how of how buildings can be deconstructed well but i think that with most sort of composite structures where 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 it's going to be very difficult i think we need to focus in on 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 sort of in situ reuse so um, I could take a, an example of, um, of, of a, a job actually at 30 South Colonnade, which is uh, down at Canary Wharf. You know, we 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 worked very hard as as to to changing the brief, to amending the brief, to to develop a scheme which uh, you know we 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 gained the, um, the the reuse out of it and were able to to to, to um, you know, install three stories on the top. So I think changing changing the, the kind of um, the question into changing the scope. Is, is probably where, where the value is going to be realised. Andrew, if you have anything to add? Yeah, no, not much. I, I'd agree. I, I haven't seen any precedence of composite construction being efficiently dismantled. I know people are thinking about using it less. If it's mm. not practical to not use it at all, can it be used in certain locations so you can retain and reuse, sorry, dismantle, your primary structure and the composites on the secondary and lots of people are exploring these things because it is it's yeah massively hampering future reuse potential at the moment okay thanks um let's move on so the next question is if a client is on board how do we make sure circular aspirations are followed through by contractors when and what needs to be included in contractor requirements to ensure real value so i think um Charlie, I'll come to you for this one. Yeah, so um, ensuring that uh, the contractor follows through is, is, is obviously a, a, a big importance. Now, I think creating an open dialogue and having um, the contractor uh, in, in collaboration with the uh, sustainab sustainability consultants is really important. And if the contractor has um, a, uh, a tangible hold on all of their processes, such that they're able to report on the um, on the construction methods, the um, the amount of labour that they've got on site, how they're commuting, um, all the way through to how much diesel they're using on site, how much water they're using on site, all those metrics which are very important to creating the narrative around how much carbon is being produced during the construction process, is 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 uh, is is where the where the sort of um, the contractor is, is it needs to be responsible for reporting that back to um, to, the, to the sustainability consultant to build that carbon model. And uh, sorry for kind of going back to the carbon one, but that that's the way in which um, you, we've, you can hold the contractor to it by establishing the trends and sort of holding them to right. We're going to try and target a 15% reduction, and then looking at the ways in which that that's going to be um, that that's going to be realised. So then you can start to look at where the real gains are going to go, going to come, whether that's from using an alternative fuel on site or whether that's just slightly adopting methodology. Um, those are things which can be worked on during the that that sort of ex, um, extended sort of design phase with with the contractor. So the way to hold them to account is certainly um, through uh, through close dialogue and an open dialogue of, 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 their, of their, their carbon outputs. Yeah, I'd agree. It can be, this is when targets and metrics do become helpful when you are kind of a setting up the, the contractual relationship. I also think um, we can be more clear perhaps with um, our clients and developers about the, the risk that they're taking on of not achieving their circularity goals with different levels of, of specification and different contracting routes as well. I mean, it's very, very difficult to, uh, you know, really embed your circular economy aspiration, I think, into like a design and build contract because there's if there's a lot of words and there may or may not be a target, especially if it's um, really early on, um, like contractor engagement. So I think that's where the collaboration comes on, making sure the team are really, really brought into it if you're doing like a, an early contractor involvement when you might not be able to set targets. And if you're, if you're bringing a contractor on board much, much later, um, have some realistic um, targets um, embedded into the, the contract. I, I think this, um, 
also touches on something that we haven't really discussed this evening yet, which is about procurement of secondhand materials. Um, so if, say, the design team and the client are all very uh, excited about using secondhand materials, reclaimed materials, and say you don't have them available on the site for your particular project, then there's a big question as to like who goes off to procure those those materials. Do we just leave it to the contractor in the way that we would these days, where you do in a traditional contract, you do a stage four design, and then the contractor would go off, find the materials through their supply chains, and build build the building? Or does the client take more control and and source perhaps source some of those materials themselves from from other sites within their network or from other clients who they're, they're working with in terms of some of those material reuse networks that are starting to, to happen in London. Um, so, yeah, I think I think there's a there's a discussion to be had there and I think we're a little way off it. But what I generally do think in the future there will be this whole like third party industry that that springs up with these secondhand materials and they will play a big part uh, so that maybe the contractor can work in a slightly more traditional role, uh, but just be told through specification that they must go and salvage secondhand steels or secondhand timber and so on and so forth. Um, but at the moment, I think it is, like you say, open dialogue, setting the brief at the start and making sure that that's communicated through all the documentation. That leads quite nicely onto uh, the next question. So um, he says, this all sounds great, but from my own experience, we found it very difficult to get the client to buy into this, both in the owner of the existing structure and also no one seems to want to buy a secondhand structure. And so I guess that there are similar experiences with secondhand materials. Do you have any examples of when you have done this? I could I could answer it in a slightly flippant way and say, yeah, we've done loads of existing buildings and the question's never been asked. Um, genuinely, we've done, and as have you probably, Laura, um, you've, we've refurbished and repurposed a huge number of existing buildings. And and that's why the clients have bought the buildings. It, it, it's for the fact that they're secondhand, it's for their heritage um, credentials. And so I think it's just a perception and mindset issue. You know, everyone, you can take a Portland Stone building in the city that's been refurbished into, into a hotel or into an office. No one says, oh, that's a second-hand structure. I don't want to go in there. They all go, oh, this is a, this is a lovely structure. This is a lovely building. It's fantastic. So I think it's just a mindset um, and trying to make people realise that actually reusing what we already have is the way forward um, and I think it will change like I think the the younger generation coming up you know far younger than me will start to demand to know where you know what's been done to these buildings uh, before they rent them before they buy them and I think it will start to happen with housing as well as commercial developments and uh, I think it's already starting to change I think it will get to a point very soon where big clients um, who have the money will be who will be demanding to know what's happened to those structures before they, they sign tenancy agreements and so on. And mm -hmm. hopefully there will be a premium for those properties. I, I completely agree with what Penny said. And I mean, and examples of, I mean, it's not when I've done it, but in the um, agricultural structure market, it's it's very common. There is there is a reuse market. If you don't need your 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 portal frame shed anymore, there's someone who'll buy it and store it, and someone else will buy it again because, you know, they know that it does what they need it to do. Um, and so I think there's examples of that. Um, I think it they're building on what what Penny was saying as well. I think it it is changing so I don't know if this is a really recent experience but um, both Penny and I were working on a, a project recently where like the client was like so how like can I have like a completely reclaimed building basically like, was, that was basically kind of the question like, I don't want anything new because of like the, the social and the environmental like kind of um, attributes that that that, that, that would um, have and then we went away and ex was starting to explore like you know well, how can you do that how how new can this new building be which is like a great a great thing to explore so um i think maybe it's it's more around 
yeah, we do need to change that perception, but I think that perception is changing. I, I just to add quickly, um, a client from a very well-known landowner in, in London asked the question to me the other day. He said, "Why, if, I, if I'm going to knock a building down after 25 years um, because I want to build a new one, and that building was designed for 50 years, and I reuse that steel, then that means I've only got 25 years worth of life out of that steel beam. And it's just such a strange misconception that needs to be educated. Um, because, you know, as we all know, if that steelwork has not been in a in any sort of uh, cyclic loading situation, it's just been a, a standard floor beam, um, and it's been in good condition and it's not showing any major signs of deterioration, then that steel is good for 100, 150 years plus. So it's um, it's something that needs to be educated, definitely. Okay, um, shall we move on to the next question then? Um, so uh, we are shortly running out of time, but um, I think I'll start with this one. So what role do structural engineers have to play in pushing the industry towards more routine use of reclaimed materials? Are they reliant on proactive clients or is there something they can do independently? So who'd like to start? Penny. I'll, I'll start if you don't mind. Um, I would say proactive clients are amazing. and uh, We'd all love to have lots of them, um, but I think we can also do quite a bit independently. Like I said earlier, we can do our own research. We all generally work in reasonably sized practices. So we know what projects are, are happening that we're involved with at a minimum. Um, so by talking across the teams, we can we can know about different materials that might be available on one site that we could potentially be using on another site. Um, I think knowledge is key. Um, someone in, within the team at work asked me the other day, oh, I've, I've just designed this um, steel frame for a small building, I think it was a pavilion or something. I said, oh, you've got loads of um, CHS sections. Why don't you go and speak to Cleveland Steel and Tubes who have loads of these sections? And off they did. And there was never any kind of brief to reuse steel work on that, on that site. But because... I, because we discussed it, they've now gone and it looks like they're going to be reusing that steelwork, secondhand steelwork. So, yeah, I think there's lots we can just do by asking the questions and proposing it. And also there's a lot of funding out there. If you do want to team up and do research with universities and, and the like, they're all screaming out for real life data. So there's a lot that we can do to help. Honestly, to add to that is the, um, the guidance from, oh, who's it from? Steel Construction Institute. Which is around just what you can embed into your if you're into your steelwork design um, to make it possible to not not over specify at the beginning to allow you to potentially use reclaimed steel as you get further and further on de um, down the design process as well. I think, um, I think designing um, with with an open mind and that sort of early age um, relaxed specification and designing how you might design um, sort of previously. So you know, looking at uh, potentially using permissible stress design rather than so uh, an over an over complicated solution through potentially a euro code you know you there are ways of justifying um existing existing materials using using different philosophies and i think that there's an onus on on designers to to, to think about that and to not necessarily bow down to every single um piece of piece of guidance that's out there and to and to really consider um, the impact of their design and, and to and to think of actually how will this 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 material or structure behave in reality and the other thing that we can all do which is it's really simple is like when you're giving your options appraisal include some of these interesting metrics against the options whether it's the carbon or the reclaimed content or its demountability in the future even the client hasn't asked for it it's only taking you a few minutes to assess each one present it to them it might spark their interest. It might become part of the brief for the next stage of the project. Yeah, that's really good. Um, all good advice. Um, so I will ask one last question. Um, and it is, I'm with a client for a new green infrastructure project in its formative stages. Where should I look for best advice on the circular economy and my project? So let's start with Andrea on that one. 
Sure. I mean, there's loads of different places. I think Will already mentioned like there's lots of resources um, in the um, iStruct website. Um, a really good um, guide I would point you to as well is the UK Green Buildings Council's, um, I think it's Circular Economy Brief for Construction Clients, I think it's called something along those lines. Um, and that kind of takes you through all the different aspects of the circular economy, what it could mean uh, to incorporate it into the brief um, and project precedents and, and directions towards other resources where they exist as well. Um, so I think that that's a really good guide. Um, our circuit project website, we're slowly adding to it. Um, and a future plug, we are going to launch a wiki in the autumn. So in the autumn, please come to the Circular Economy wiki. Um, but that does not exist yet. But I think um, places like the institutions, um, UK Green Building Council, um, Alliance for Sustainable Building Products, um, all put out um, lots of good guidance. And, and Letty as well is currently producing some guidance um, that should be out shortly as well. I think this is an opportunity for a shameless plug. I mean, really, the, um, the experienced experience contractors are the way where you need to go. So, um, you know, I think you know, reaching out to the right team is, is, way, is where you really need to be looking and to associate, you know, bringing those people into that conversation can, um, can really open, open the door and so make you realise sort of where the material um, asset values are. Yeah, I mean, I would echo everything that's been said. Um, I think there's some good books out there as well that are worth worth reading, I would say. This one by Dave, um, I'm going to get it wrong. Building Revolutions um, is a good book, is a good starting point. I think I read that a few years ago, and that just explains everything in, in really useful terms relevant to the built environment. Yeah, there's the Reuse Atlas as well, isn't there? Uh, yeah. Duncan Baker Brown, and there's... Uh, my favourite one at the moment is, I think it's called Building Our Circular Future from 3XN Architects in Copenhagen. Um, low, I mean, not very many UK, I don't think, but loads of examples in there of different types of um, circularity as well to draw inspiration from, as well as practical guidance. Amazing, thank you for, um, for all of that. And um, thanks for all your thoughtful responses to um, my and the audience's questions. And that's all we have time for. So um, thanks everyone for attending and have a lovely evening.